15. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024 and beyond, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 15 Patreon subscribers away from achieving this goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you can help keep Fishing the DMV alive. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month. You will also get 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, our newest sponsor who won best in show at the Richmond Expo. You'll also be a part of our private Facebook group community, weekly prize giveaways, and so much more. If you would like to support our show, check out our Patreon link down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. We are here February 19th. My God, will winter end. Please let it be over with. Uh, I am I have one more weekend of doing the uh, seminar gauntlet. We had Augusta County two weeks ago, which was fantastic. And then we have the Kayak Fishing Show Expo at Jake's Bait and Tackle. And then literally 24 hours later, kicks off my tournament season with the Four Locks uh, Early Bird Tournament up there on the Upper Potomac. Got a little pre-fishing in today. It is cold. Water temperatures are 38 degrees, so that's just absolutely balmy. Uh, another uh, little note is I had a ton of people asking me about the Tidal Bass Summit that the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources is putting on. I called them last week. They do not want me to record it. They don't want to live stream it this year. I offered to do it for free. They are really hesitant about that. Needless to say, technically I'm media, so I'm still going to show up anyway, and I'm going to see what I can kind of get done there because I think it's a little weird that they're holding a open door thing to talk about our bodies of water, but they're afraid to put it out there on their social media networks. So uh, that's pretty much all I got for housekeeping. Uh, as always, guys, with these shows, Ask a question, win a prize. That's how all these things work. You'll win a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Without further ado, I have the man, the myth, the legend, Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake. How are you doing, sir? Wonderful intro, as always, my friends. Oh, just got to keep the legend great. I left every time. And now that I'm a parent, I think I can understand the what the hell is that guy. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll is see. that... I guess that is public knowledge. So yeah, congratulations. The first time you've been on the show as yeah. a dad now. Do I look tired? Oh, uh, not no more than usual. No makeup either. I did it's, take a day, I did take a day nap. I was going to say, I don't know if it's the kid or the six border collies you have now. How many do you have? Yeah, 14 dogs and we're downsizing our house because that's the right thing to do for the environment. At least the kid doesn't chew up your floors and stuff. So oh, that's good. Dude. I have, uh, I have about seven pieces of uh, flooring that I'm going to need to replace. The deck's a hot mess. And uh, oh. yeah, there's probably 30 tennis balls under the basement, uh, under the basement couch, but it's all good. He's a good dog, dude. He just, he is an actual border collie. I think we thought we could get away with it with three. The first one was super chill and didn't really have border collie tendencies. The second one has a little bit of hurting as you can hear them. Um, and then ghost is like, um, I, I, I gotta get a Frisbee cause when I throw the tennis ball, he's not waiting for it to get close to him. He's yeeting off the, off the couch and like doing spins in the air and stuff and getting a couple feet off the ground. So I think, I think if I get him a Frisbee, I could probably teach him the whole like run and jump, um, run and jump for the Frisbee. So, which would be pretty cool. Never a dull day in your life. Uh, no. never a dull day. So with this show, everyone, we are about two weeks out from the the kickoff to really the BFL season in our neck of the woods. I think it's the Piedmont Division, March 9th. So really, we're going to try to kind of compress in a fishing report kind of tournament prep because your season, I mean, you kicked ass this past weekend, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll talk about tournament season, and then we're going to really end the show with sponsorship talk. Uh, now that I have, I guess I have a little bit of a following now and people are asking me about how to get sponsors, which is funny because I don't even know how the hell to do it. So I thought we'd bring on a professional to actually talk about that stuff. Cool. So yeah, I mean, let's kind of, I kind of get into it with first going back in time. How many terms did you fish this weekend? Two? One? Two. Yep. Yeah. Double header. So, so Smith mountain, uh, runs a winter trail, which is just kind of the local guys, local hammers, 15, 20, 25 boats. Those have been going on for a while was able to get a dub on one of those. Um, and then 
obviously we had baby Charlotte and, and took some breaks there. And then my wife is a straight warrior princess. And four days after, um, after Charlotte was in the house and Taylor felt cool, she was like, you can start guiding again. So my maternity leave was, was four days, which was, which was solid. And, um, then we had a double header this weekend. So like the first, I guess I would say kind of official bigger tournament was the Fishers of Men was Saturday and then the cat trail, uh, was Sunday and then Smith Mountain's about to have a tournament every weekend, if not, uh, or every other weekend, if not every weekend here, pretty much for the next probably two months plus. So it's gonna, it's gonna be, uh, a lot of boats out there. The fishing is, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in detail, obviously, but it's a, a little bit different than the last couple of years. The lake stayed high this winter, which was nice. I don't think the power company really had to kind of fluctuate the water that much. I, I know you mentioned that winter's over. I think I just made a post the other day about, uh, to me, I think maybe we get one or two little cold snaps, maybe like two or three days of chili. But I think we're going to have an early spring again. Like last year, I had a bed fish locked on last. I looked in my, I looked in my notes last March 11th. I had a four and a half pounder that I went back to a couple days in a row just to check and see what was up that, uh, that we were able to catch on guide trips. And, um, yeah, the water looks really good color. And obviously from the fishers of men, it was blowing on Saturday, but there was eight bags over 20 pounds, um, and a ninth bag right at, right at 20. So the, the, the big ones are on the move. If you can get good weather conditions for spring fishing and, and power fishing, it's, it's a 20 pound plus kind of day. And then on those slick, calm days, it's still a little bit tough to try to figure them out. You're still having to slow down and stuff, but the fish are, the fish are ready to eat for sure. We've talked about this agnosium, but it's worth bringing up again. Is it daylight water temperature? Yes. To all the above like yeah. w water level. Cause I know we, I think we had a waxing moon. I forget. I stared up the damn sky today and I remember wanting to note at it. It was more moon than it usually is. Um, and it also snowed more this year than I think last year. Yep. How, how does all that play into it? So we're in El Nino or whatever, whichever one is the warmer, wetter of the two weather systems. I don't know if it's Nino or Nino. Um, so I was expecting us to have a little bit wetter of a winter and definitely some snows, which we did get some snows here. Um, I posted that video of, of fishing out in the snow and caught a seven pounder. Um, so it's that it definitely is daylight hours. Remember fish don't have calendars. They have no idea what's going on. So they're going to go strictly based on the light. And if it's able to get sunny at 7 AM and it doesn't get dark until 6 PM, that is instant on their biological clock that they need to start moving and start figuring out what's going on. Um, and then with high water and stained water, you have bait that's feeling more protected back further in the pockets. They're not having to go out onto the main lake and be in 60, 70, 80 feet deep in the treetops. They feel fine being in 10 feet of water on a stain secondary um, and just kind of swimming around. And it's, it's provided the bass to move back quicker. Um, there's a lot of fish 25 to 50% back in pockets. There's even some really big ones, big isolated single fish that are way in the back um, that are already being caught that, I, that I've caught some that way. Um, and I don't, think you're going to have to run back out and be on the super, super deep stuff, um, coming up for tournament season here. I think, I think pretty much from this weekend on, you're going to have constant waves with warming trends of, of the next wave of fish coming up. And I wouldn't be surprised if I find some bed fish. I don't think there'll be anything on a bed before the BFL. I would say two weeks, like away from having some fish on beds, but I think we'll, we'll have an early spawn for sure. I think for the second BFL in April, it'll probably be a straight up bed fishing fest. I think that kind of lines up with last year's second BFL there. That was absolutely, it was insane. Yeah. Uh, the weights that were actually brought into that. Yep. Would you say that, I mean, I think pre-spawn is such a vague ass term. When it's really is like, it's more of like, I think the late winter move before mm -hmm. you get into true secondary point, blah, blah, blah stuff. So where would you say they are then right now? If you had to tag them, would it be considered late winter or full pre-spawn? No, still late, still late winter. So you can go right now and catch a keeper fish, a, probably a better caliber fish in five feet of water. It's just going to take you a lot of time to find that one fish. 
Um, but I would say we're in that late winter where you can still go out on the main lake and catch threes to fours suspended chasing bait. Um, we're out on kind of that like typical winter stuff. Um, and then you've maybe got a small population, 15% of the total population that's like on the first secondary going into pockets. And then that's a variety of sizes. Some of them are bucks. Some of them are three to five pounders. That just takes the time of being out on the water to kind of figure out where they're at. But they're at that first kind of stopping station of, you know, they moved for two days and then stopped on the rock pile or stopped on the treetop or the brush. And and what I will say is I get a lot of questions this time of year from guide clients and, and people that, that struggle. And we struggled on Sunday pretty bad. Um, I mean, I had a 470 that I caught definitely in, in an interesting way, but um, those warm days are the transition days. Those are the days that the bass, the water's warm. There's no wind. It's sunny all day post front. Those are the days where you see on live scope, two or three blimps that are suspended over 50 feet off of a point and they won't chase or look at anything. Those are bass that are warming up and they're swimming down the bank another 30 yards, 50 yards that day, and then stopping, seeing what the next day brings, going back more or staying there. And they're just kind of lackadaisical. You can, you can almost feel it when you fish for them mm. on those slick d- days where if you just kind of visualize like, okay, I'm full of eggs. I'm not really that hungry today. Like let's kind of move back to where we need to back, go back to. Um, so those ones will anger the hell out of you. Um, and be pretty frustrating to chase. You can still get some to bite, um, but it's a lot of it is cadence and, and matching the hatch and really the butt, you have to pay attention to the bite window and moonrise stuff. But that's kind of where I see this spring bite is currently. We're not in that full pre-spawn where those fish will eat more often. We're in that late winter where it's like, I don't know, let's, let's use an example of three, five pounders came out of 65 feet yesterday and now they're on a secondary point and they're 25 feet deep on a 40 foot point Mm. they're just kind of sitting there those fish aren't really ready to eat they're still cold they're kind of moving up but then on the day where it blows they go from that 25 feet to 10 and you can throw jerk bait and get them as always guys ask questions in the end ask questions ask questions win a prize that's how this works ask question you win a prize first question that i have is one old thing that i used to hear is fish only move up. They don't move back. So if they start moving up towards the spawn and the cold front hits or whatever, that doesn't mean they're going to retrace their steps all the way back to the winter positions. And that's kind of, I was going to ask you, do you kind of believe into that mindset that they'll move up, but if cold hits, they just basically just shut down where they are. Correct. 100%. They either shut down or they go to the bottom. So Mm -hmm. a big, this is where you see really versatile anglers do really, really well is if it's blown windy, especially on Smith mountain or really any Highland reservoir pre-spawn, like it's power fishing, they're going to bite, like they're ready to eat stuff's getting stirred up. It's post front. When we have two days of high sun, no wind, those fish don't go anywhere. They suck to the bottom. They're just, they don't want to deal with the cold water. That's that's up in the top water, top of the water column. And they just are sitting still on the bottom. And that's where you, you know, I've got a couple examples of jigs laying out here that we'll talk about, but that's where jig fishing comes in in the spring, Ned rig, shaky head, um, free rig, like stuff where you're having to dead stick baits on the bottom. So they do not turn around. The only time I'm ever worried about fish turning around is really fall time when the bait has to go back out of the shallows because it gets too cold too quick. So, and like I, like I mentioned this year, there's definitely bait way back already in some of the pockets, um, and big bait, there's big gizzard chads in the back of some of the, some of the major pockets too. So yeah, I I wouldn't, um, if you're coming for that tournament or in fishing a tournament before the BFL, I wouldn't say, you know, oh my God, it was cold for two nights in a row. Now we got to go fish main lake out deep. They're definitely not going to turn around that fast. Do you, let me try to think about how I'm going to state this question. Do you feel like there was a, any type of kill off in the forage species this past winter, or was it pretty mild when it comes to uh, shad mortality? Yeah. Mild again. I think, I don't remember what the, t- no, I'm like, what was the temperature when Charlotte was born? Cause I wasn't out on the water and it, that was that weird day where it was like 80 <laughs> degrees. And like everyone that was coming into the hospital was like, uh, I'm drenched in sweat from walking from the parking lot. Um, 
we had that one stretch of about five days of freezing, but the water was still like 48, 49 degrees. And I think that's what dropped it to 44, but you got to get into like 40 to 42 to really see stun. The jerk bait bites still there. It just isn't, it doesn't last very long in the morning. It's kind of like first hour, first two hours maybe where, yeah, the water probably dropped a little bit overnight. If your overnight low is below 32, um, but I'm not really having to slow down my jerk bait cadence very much this year. So I just, I don't think the stun really happened that bad. So is it safe to say that there's a, there's, you can equate a greater shad die off to a better jerk bait bite then? Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll agree with that. Um, just because I think they go into like vacuum mode, bro. Yeah. It, like if there's. 700 shad in a back pocket two of them two of the big pods are pushed up against a dock and they all stun overnight i mean if you were a bass you'd just literally sit there and barely move and suck one back every five minutes um i think it's just how you have to fish the jerk bait on pauses and stuff like that well, one thing that i'll say because you and me have done these podcasts enough with with winter time stuff one thing that really stuck with me this winter which was strange and i don't know sometimes you just hear people say a certain thing and a saying and it sticks is um brian who's the bass angler alabama brian latimer uh there is a brian yes there is a brian latimer yeah b lad or whatever his name yeah, is yeah yeah, yeah, I, don't B-Lad, I, yeah. I don't know what i watched or maybe it was a reel or something like that and he was talking about how winter fishing is everyone thinks winter fishing is tough and that they're not eating and and kind of you have to slow down and all this sort of other stuff and then his point at the end of the video was like yet every fish you catch in the winter is massive mm-hmm. super overweight like full of either crayfish or shad so that tells you because we're not out there all the time is they're eating a lot um and we think that just because the water's in the 40s that you need to slow down massively and and the jerk bait specifically you have to mess with the cadence stuff but but i'm i'm barely even putting a pause and i barely had to put a pause on my jerk bait bite all winter and that's how we caught a good um, a good majority of our fish on Saturday was tossing a jerk bait. And honestly, everyone should be happy and proud. I barely, I barely even use live scope on Saturday to fish in the jerk bait. I was just going down the bank, twitching it at what they were telling me they wanted it twitched and staying super far off the bank and, and basically didn't try to utilize, um, live scope as much as possible and was able to put almost 21 pounds in the boat. Jesus, That's insane. So it felt good. Yeah, I would my, bet that yeah, feel good. My my back and my neck felt good. That's something I'm adjusting on mine for some reason because I have a 15 inch, uh, I have a 15 inch helix and a 10 inch uh, Garmin, which I yeah. really got to get a bigger one because I, I either need a bigger screen or some LASIK. Um, but I have 360, and the problem is the mount I have it has 360 up front, the 15 inch screen, and I have the 10 inch screen below that, and Jesus, it kills my neck yeah. looking down like that. That yeah. is definitely changing this year. Um, yeah, okay. it'll, it'll tweak your, uh, I don't think I'd ever get that $4,000 TV screen. Um, but I know I, talk- yeah, I think I would get, is it beat down outdoors makes the adjustable mount that you can twist and slide up like 24 yes. or something crazy. Yeah. Um, I would consider that dude. Cause after three years of guiding and using live scope for, you know, eight months of the year and having to do that, um, I definitely have to go to the chiropractor more than I should. Well, what about, um, and maybe we're talking about the same screen. I think Fighter's running it now. It's some plasma screen that you can just hook up to whatever garment you have. Yeah, you have to get an 8610 or like the GPS unit yeah. to, be able to, to be able to mirror it. But yeah, it's basically you're sticking an 8610 somewhere in a compartment and then feeding it to, feeding it to that screen. I don't even know what size it is, but... 16 and 22 because i did look to see how much it would cost um i saw someone on a facebook forum that was like hooked up a they're like screw the screen i bought a vizio for 59 (laughs) dollars and everyone's like what happens when it rains or you take a wave over the front or like the trolling motor splashes water on it he's like you just go home if it rains and i'm like dude we are getting out of hand boys if you need to buy a 50 dollar tv to and like he had it mounted and everything so I mean, I watched Hensley, that that cool ass place. If I said that right, sorry guys, if you're listening, uh, down in Alabama, they just installed. I think it was like four black boxes in this one boat down there, which is just Jesus God. I mean, yeah, anyway, I don't want to do any of that. 
It's a lot. And I, guys, you are pouring in the questions. So we'll get some of these questions answered here because I think they're kind of uh, present to what we're talking about now. Let me see which one we'll go with first. Let's go with uh, Doug. Doug Fitzgerald. Doug, which part of the lake you head to in the spring or head to the river? Which part of the lake do you head to in the spring or do you head to the river? Gotcha. Um, Doug, good question. So uh, for anybody that hasn't been to Smith Mountain, we're a highland reservoir. It's a dammed up river system, two rivers, Blackwater and Roanoke River. Um, we don't get stain really on the lower end. Stain goes about down to the state park or a little bit past Gills Creek on the Blackwater side. I would tell you if you have uh, any way of finding it, and I, I know I just took out a guide client that has the deep dive app. I've mm -hmm. never used it. I'm not familiar with it, but I guess there's a feature you can use on it where it tells you the water clarity live. It's a pro feature, I guess, but somehow they're taking satellite images like multiple times a day. Hmm. Um, I would tell you it doesn't matter where it is up the Blackwater or Roanoke, but find green water. So why? Nutrient dense. It's not as stained as like your cold, muddy water. Like we hear pros talk about all the time, like 45 degree mud water is terrible. You can find like soup pea green. Um, it's nutrient dense. There's enough stain where the bass don't get a great look at your lure. The bait feels safe in that. And there's, you know, the microbiology of that water is good for the bait. Um, so just, if you can drive around, I would say launch at the state park, launch at parkway, launch at Anthony Fords and head up the river. So you find that green water, um, and work your way up to, to where it turns. Uh, so you can still fish kind of like a light brown water, kind of like the color that's on my my uh ceiling um that that stuff's fine but once you get into the, like the yoohoo looking chocolate milk i'd probably turn around but that's where i would start the other side of that question is it's depending on how you like to fish and how confident you are in clear water um so <laughs> i fished with somebody new this weekend um a guy mm -hmm. named landon um, came up and jumped in for the fishers of men and him and I keep joking about making some sort of like funny fish clothing line. Um, and he, he yelled, um, we were running up the lake and we had our good bag or whatever. And we actually caught our bag out of clear water, but he used the term clear water cowboys, which I thought was kind of, a, kind of a catchy, cool term or whatever. It, so it's all dependent. I like fishing the clear water. I think it, doesn't get as much pressure in the spring. There's a lot more smallmouth around and smallmouth are more aggressive in the spring because they're hungry and they're, they're a-holes. Um, yeah. Like Sunday, somebody weighed in a 495, like an almost five pound smallie. Uh, hey. Yeah, yeah, big. So, and, and the smallmouth are gonna spawn before the largemouth. So if you're looking for pre-spawn fat fish, the lower end is going to have some of those big smallmouth. I don't think you're going to catch 23 to 25 pounds on smallies, but you could probably put two fish over three pounds in the live well fish in the lower end. So that's, I, that's how I would break down where I would start. I love what you said though, about honestly paraphrasing you, but fish your strength. If you are a dirty water spinnerbait guy, don't go fish clear water. If you like to fish a Demiki rig, just go find what works for you. And yep. I feel like a lot of people just try to say like, what is the best thing versus what fits their style? Sure. And you can catch 20 pounds doing either. That's what's amazing about Smith Mountain Lake and why I love living here and guiding here is you can go catch 20 pounds on a Demiki rig and you can go up a river and throw a Colorado spinner blade, spinner bait down probably a hundred yard stretch of trees and go back and forth on it four times and catch 20 pounds. So it, it's kind of pick, it's kind of pick what you'd like to do. Um, but there's a lot of fish moving, uh, moving around. And, and like I said earlier, as far as eight to nine bags over 20, um, it's a good time of year to get confidence where if you're not catching a three and a half pound fish, you know, it's time to move. Like you can tell that from the tournament weights that those fish are moving up. So hmm. it's a good way to kind of cover the lake quickly as far as where to start. But that's what I'd tell you to do, Doug is, pick your poison and, or run both. If you're confident with both, take, take half your day and run up the river, take the other half and run down the lake. What I would use as a starting thing for that is if it's cloudy and calm, fish the clear water. If it's sunny and, or if it's cloudy and windy, fish the clear water. If it's sunny and calm, go to the dirty water. That's just a generic kind of like fishing 
thing to use as a as a starting spot. Adam Harkness, you have commented about 78 times. So you know what? I'm gonna throw you a bone here. Um so Adam, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackled for one of your questions, not all seven of them. Uh what section of the lake has the most submerged timber that the fish relate to in the colder water? As always, email me, fishingdv at gmail.com, Instagram or Facebook to reclaim your gift card. Adam, the mid lake to lower end is where you're going to find most offshore timber to do your, your Demiki swim bait, a rig, if you really want to get one down that deep. But the way that Smith mountain Lake is set up is they cut all the trees down to 25 feet. So look on your topography. If you find a long point, run your boat from 15 feet out to a hundred. And when you hit about 40 feet, you're start, you'll start seeing tree tops on, um, on your side scan and your down scan um you're looking for clumps of trees that are together or you're looking for big single isolated like one tree that's a little bit taller than the rest and when i say a little bit it could be three feet taller than the rest but it's bushier that's your that's kind of your holding spot for those fish um and don't be afraid to go super deep there's fish or sorry there's trees that are 80 feet tall under the water so you could have the boat in 100 feet and a tree that's 80 feet tall so it's like you're fishing 20 feet deep and you will look lost um you'll look like you're having engine issues out in the middle of the lake but you you can find some very special spots it takes a long time to find them um but if you do find them i've i've definitely ran into some tree tops that you've been able to go back to for a month that have really good fish we have a great question here. I just got to bring this one up. Jonathan Brooks, uh, all these damn Potomac boys in this chat right now. Oh, well, yeah, man, they're getting ready. We have... Up, Matt, yes. He's, got, he's uh, stayed at my house and in, in when we were running the Airbnb before. He's a good uh, dude. Oh, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, he's a good dude. Are you still running the Airbnb or is that uh, gone? Bye-bye. No, and I feel bad because now that, now that uh, social media is as big as it is, I've probably had... 15 guys hit me up about, Hey, do you know a spot to stay for the BFLs? We can't find a good spot and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, yeah, we, we shut her down just to enjoy the entire house and we don't want anybody, um, one, either waking the baby up or two, it'd be awful experience if you were a fisherman here and we're waking up three times in the middle of the night with a crying baby or the dogs barking. So that's actually a smart move, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. It's more for them, more for them, less for us, but your tournament season never ended, did it? Mm -mm. Couple <laughs> weeks, couple weeks when Charlotte was uh, when Charlotte was born, um, dude. It's again for anybody that's on here that's either got a girlfriend or, or married, and and your wife's extremely supportive. Also, um, yes, is she knows well enough that if there's really nothing on the calendar and there's a twenty mile an hour gust pretty much from November through March that I'm probably going to hook the boat up and go fishing for a little while. So, um, the winter trail, you know, guiding, guiding slows down a little bit. Um, I've been super blessed with a lot of repeat clients and new clients, um, in the, in the off season. And I do have to shout out to a lot of my repeat clients. Like, so I love the fishing community and I'll tell you a story from today, but like, uh, Pat Kiss sent us a, a baby gift. Um, oh, multiple cool. people that guide with me have sent us baby gifts. Um, a lot of people did our meal train for us when we weren't cooking. When we kind of fresh got here, I, I delivered a rod to a repeat client today. Just met him up at the gas station that owns a house here. And he's going to Belize to fish for bonefish. And his wife gave us three books for the baby room. Like just the fishing community just gets like just gets human connection and, and just being awesome. And it's been, it's been cool to see the outpouring of like just awesomeness with bringing a baby in. So. Speaking of babies, let's talk about tournament prep because I don't know how the hell to segue that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, your season never shut down. So do you just change? I mean, you did get the boat spruced up, I believe. I think that mm -hmm. happened in late November, December that you got it spruced up. So you got yep. that done. Um, yep. So is it just moving crap in and out of the boat? Is that your tournament prep? Yeah. So I got a bunch of baits here too. We'll talk about as far as, so, so what's kind of unique or nice about this one is I am not fishing the BFL in March. Ooh. Um, I, I have a wedding to shoot, um, taking that guaranteed money instead of, um, going out and slinging a swim bait. So, um, I will show you guys baits that, that I would have on the deck that I would 
100% they have been throwing anyways. Um, and hopefully that helps a couple guys, uh, guys through the tournament. So yeah, tournament preps, uh, maintenance. So a lot of you guys let your boat sit for a long time, um, maybe two, three months without running it on a regular basis. Um, so it's a lot of like tightening down, checking bolts, checking oil, kind of the boat maintenance. I would tell a lot of the guys that are traveling, like Pat is talking about Potomac guys up in here, um, check your hubs. That's the worst freaking thing ever is, hey, tournament season's awesome. You're super pumped. It's the first big one of the year and you're driving down the road at freaking three o'clock in the morning and your shit blows up. Um, so <laughs> yeah. a lot of the maintenance stuff like that. And then for me, it's um, a lot of the plastics were out of the boat. You know, I'm not throwing a wacky Senko and I'm not throwing, um, you know, I'm not throwing too much shaky head stuff or, or really those kind of plastic things in the dead of winter. Now that we're turning into this early spawn and or pre-spawn and having an early spring, a lot of plastics are ending up back in the boat. Um, and uh, just kind of reorganizing line is another big thing. If you're in your tournament off season, this is the time where you got to get the credit card out or whatever, shell out your, you know, get your 660 yards of some line or whatever you need to get to re-spool. And you're spending that day kind of cleaning up rods, rod eyes and, and spooling back up. I do a lot of hook change too. So um, I might upsize some hooks on my mega bass stuff, change some hooks on some crankbaits and, uh, and just kind of do that nuance kind of stuff before the season starts. Cause I don't want to have to worry about it or think that I didn't do it um, hours before a tournament. So, cause this is, this is the time of year and I went on a, I had a phenomenal uh, week of fishing before Charlotte was born. I caught three seven pounders in five days of fishing. Um, this is the this is the time of year where if you don't do that maintenance on your line, on your hooks, on your swivels, um, on your split rings, that type of stuff, you're you're gonna hurt your feelings really bad, especially at Smith Mountain. And if we stay wet um, or stay stained, and they don't drop the water, and we get these warming trends, there's there's gonna be some big fish caught in the stained water this year. That is interesting. Yeah. So hmm. we had three 10 pounders that I saw on Facebook. So I don't know that it necessarily happens. It'll probably happen to somebody in practice, which is just gut wrenching. But, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people, if we see some sevens and eights get caught during practice on the ninth. <clears throat> Do you think it'll take 25 pounds to win one of the BFLs this year? If it blows 20 miles an hour on the ninth, yes. Wow. Hot so, take, hot take. Yeah. You easily, get easily 20. 25, yes, if it's the right wind direction. I'm trying to think the, I don't have this off the top of my head, the one in April, um, mm -hmm. I took 23 pounds or 22? I think it was 22 pounds. 22, almost 23, I think. 22.10. Yeah, I thought it was right around that 21, 22 ish area, but there's a couple of bags I thought that were up there because it was yep. really high and loaded, uh, the weights there. Some dude had a 20 pound bag of smallies only. Oh, right. Oh, shit. I forgot about that. Dude, yeah. that was freaking insane. And, and crazy. we have the same comment about us uh, 600 times in the comment section. So, uh, Wayne, whiny, whatever. I'm sorry, I can't speak English. Uh, whiny, uh, do you think bass are on the beds by the first week of April? And you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle, sir. So message me. I'm going to go with Quinn. Quinn? Sorry. I, again, I have, I probably have downs. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, 100%. There will be bass on beds. There may be some post-spawn fish by that point. I wouldn't rule out maybe like a buzz bait. Um, if we don't get some sort of weird abnormal or winter weather that comes in for a long stretch, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't put a buzz bait off the list. Um, but most likely you're going to see a very large wave of bass end of March, first week of April come in. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be awesome. Which one takes more technical skill, you think, to to do well in? The one in March or the one in April? April feels like it's the Tyler Cox. If as long as you have a swim bait and a, and a wacky worm on there, you gotta you gotta punch your chance of doing well for April. Yeah, for April compared to March. March, I feel like you do need a little bit more strategy. Um, I would, uh, me personally, I would say the opposite. But maybe that's my mm. confidence in 
pre-spawn fishing and throwing like swim bigger swim baits and like bigger baits and targeting like six to eight pounders because hmm. if you put two big ones in the boat in a bfl and go catch three and a half pounders you're sitting clutch where the april one you're dealing with such a population at smith mountain that sure you take, up, yeah. you take a senko for two days of practice and you might only catch one four pounder because it's just inundated with 14 inch bucks mm. everywhere so you could come catch a limit sure but to put together a 20 plus pound bag of spawners only when there's that many dudes on the lake practicing finding similar fish and we have waves like we could be we could have a crazy spring and it's the tail end of the spawn by april by by the second week of april and then at that point you're talking about like zombie fish that are just swimming down the bank and everyone's going to be super annoyed seeing 30 pounds of bass swim between docks and not care um hmm. so and then on the other side bed fishing is bed fishing is a skill man um nice. you got to be really especially for the big the, the biggest bass for bed fishing as far as largemouth go Dude, they're in the smallest little nook and cranny hole that you got to shoot with a bait or a lay down that looks like a spider web. Um, as far as getting those fish out and presenting a bait a certain way, that that's why I have 10 foot poles on my or 10 foot raptors on my boat because I want to be able to stay super far away during bed season or put the boat in at a deeper angle than anybody else can to try to to try to make it be different. But I think bed fishing is tough on bigger fish. So I would say hmm. me personally, I think it'd be easier to go sling a swim bait in March with a little bit of wind than try to go find enough four and a half to six pounders on beds that not everyone else found. Is that the new jig? Honestly, is, is the glide bait resurgence, the mag draft, is that basically, because I remember when I was doing high school fishing back in the early two thousands, they talked about, you know, that old guy in the club, that old guy, they're like, man, he locks a jig in his hand. He either catches nothing or he's going to win the thing. And I feel like sure. that's basically sounds like swim bait culture now. Yeah. The, the other side, and this is where it's, I think better than a jig is at least you can see what you're fishing around. I mean, it, it, it would be a very good idea in March and in April to chuck around a big bait for two days of practice. You can find docks at Smith that have five fish underneath them. That is 26 pounds. Those fish aren't going to go anywhere a day later, or if they did, they went two docks to the left or a dock to the right or to the rock pile on the point. Um, so I like chucking a big bait in tournament practice because you can see what caliber of fish you're around. Um, and then you can go back with a jig. Like if you get a slick, calm condition or even more finesse, if you can't get them to bite a jig on 16 pound line or 14 pound line and go on stupid finesse, then throw a Ned rig on seven pound line or throw a Senko on seven yeah. pound line under a dock where there's three, six pounders um, and, and try to pull one of them out. I, I shy away from trying to force that big bite if the conditions aren't exactly what I feel comfortable with them biting. Um, but that's a good tournament. That's a good tournament approach is throw a big bait. Smith Mountain is is known for big fish and big bait eaters. So take the time to look using that bait for a couple of days of practice. And bed fishing too, man. You can use a glide bait to piss off a bed fish okay. more than anything. Um, yeah. But you're not going to catch her on a glide bait. Do you do anything with your hooks in practice? Because I, I, I see so many guys that they will, they'll throw a big ass mag draft on the Friday and they're like, yeah, I caught 27 pounds. Like, do you do anything like cut the hook or yeah. embed it or something? First off, if you only get one day of practice, don't set the hook. Like, just please don't do it. I know it's super hard, guys. And I, I'm coming from a place where I can hook the boat up and be in the water in 15 minutes, but it's really not a good idea to smash a bag, especially some of the, some of the, some of the like smaller tournaments here, a hundred percent. Yeah. There's not going to be enough pressure, but a BFL and anglers, any of the tournaments that are going to draw 70 boats more or uh, over a hundred, if you only get one day of practice, just force yourself to take the hooks off or bend them in or tin foil the edges, um, or just print, pinch the barbs down or something like that. Hooks cost a dollar 25 mm. on the big ones just just do yourself a favor because you will like i said you will hurt your feelings here um like the guys that practice for the big bass dude it happens every single big bass that's here some dude posts or some dude takes a giant one to captain's quarters and it's like 
that fish would have won the yeah. boat, but they caught it six hours before off limits because um, they came down from Pennsylvania or wh whatever the case may be. So that, that would be my approach. I know it sucks. You guys want to catch fish. I totally get it a hundred percent, but yeah, for me on tournaments that are that size, if I'm cranking, I honestly take the hooks off. Um, it doesn't like uh, a sonic side for mega bass, a wart, something that moves around a Z one, like just it's, it's digging into the bottom or it's got the right motion with hooks or without. So just take the hooks off. You'll be able to feel a head shake of a fish and, and feel the pressure of a fish. Um, glides, maybe you have to put like some suspend dots on there for the day just to get it down um, or just bend the hooks in and and um, and do that. And then, yeah, mag draft, I'll usually like bury, bury the hooks or bend the hooks out the wrong way. Dude, that the guys, that is some really good stuff. And we have it's and we got like 50 people watching on Facebook and YouTube, and we also yeah. have 30 people watching on Instagram, but StreamYard still won't let me uh share those questions. And we have a bunch on Instagram, so I'm gonna get to Instagram questions now. Cool. Calvin uh says, In the spring, do you recommend throwing big baits? If so, what types? Uh, I think we just mentioned them, but do you have a specific yeah. glide or um glides not not so much i mean you want to start with something that's not as choppy um so like a bull glide or a piz or a paperweight or something that's definitely a little bit slower on the s kick not as not as choppy um would be a good place to start and then as far as the swim baits go i'm just going to start kind of grabbing baits here and there i didn't so grab fun. the big 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 giant ones um you definitely can throw an eight or a 10 inch mag. I just didn't grab one, but everybody knows this bait. It's popular for a reason. It isn't going out of production and it isn't going out of people's carts on tackle warehouse or at the tackle shop is a mag draft. So there's knockoffs that are very similar to this. There are new baits that are more innovative or just newer. But the reason that the mag draft, in my opinion, is still the best swim bait in the spring is the actual roll and tail motion. So they're all somewhat close, but I think the mag draft still holds tried and true as far as the tightest wobble for like the density of plastic. Now, one thing I definitely do to modify a mag draft is I will throw unweighted because you really have to fish that same thing slow. But then I don't know if you guys can see or not, and kind of push it out but i've got a nail weight right there hmm. so i'll take a dobbins uh like an eighth cut off both the ends and just basically start with one and then start jamming nail weights in here horizontal until i feel like i'm getting the right speed for the day um, and sometimes they do want this thing swimming pretty fast so you have to weight it pretty good but if you jam nail weights into a mag draft you can start increasing your speed and not lose that uh, really, really tight wobble. And then another thing, it's not on this mag draft, but I will give away this deal. I'm not exactly sure who showed me. Shannon Wheeler definitely does this a lot too, is get yourself some toothpicks. Sometimes the magnet on the mag draft falls out when you're skipping. What you can do is engage it with the magnet right there on this bait. You can actually see that hook in there, maybe a little bit for you guys, as you can take a toothpick and hold that hook in the mag draft and break both ends of it. That allows the bait to be skipped a lot better and keep that hook up hmm. high. So if you're going over a lay down or over a rock pile or over a dock or something like that. But when you get a bite, you're going to set the hook hard enough that it's going to break the toothpick. I got to try that because I've been using a rubber band. I got to experiment with that. See like if that rubber works band better. all the way up through here. Yeah, a very thin rubber band and I wrap it. And yep. I've got to try the toothpick one. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I've never done the rubber band if it doesn't affect the the look or feel or anything like that then i mean yeah it looks like it's got like a chastity belt on so <laughs> it does affect the look a bit. it's the virgin mag draft yeah. just coming around <laughs> awesome uh, so so real quick on hitting on what this is so the reason the mag draft excels in springtime is gizzard shed so this is not supposed to be a thread fin or a ghost minnow even really a blueback i mean bluebacks do get big but maybe not this big is you're imitating gizzard shad. So if you're in a tournament and on a search, what you wanna be looking for is doing your side scan and finding different sizes of bait. And you wanna be looking for that bait that looks bigger, like much bigger. Um, and you'll see them on live scope. Ghost minnows look like little static. 
thread fins are going to look like little, little minnows and gizzards are going to look like, I don't know, like perch swimming around, excuse me, like perch swimming around or something like that. And you'll, you'll see where they're at. Um, you'll spook them sometimes with your trolling motor, just kind of use your live scope or your side scan, um, with that. So the other bait that I throw, and this is as we get closer to actual pre-spawn. Um, and I, I am a big believer in the kick, the tail kick is a determining factor on if they're going to commit or not is also from mega bass, which is the spark shad. So obviously you guys can see it's a soft plastic body on the tail, but you can see because it's got that much thin tail on the backside, you're going to get a ton more kick out of this thing. So these two are always rigged on the boat basically from January on but I'll notice like a light switch, all of a sudden they'll go from gagging on a mag draft to following a mag draft. And I pick this thing up and they'll start choking on this thing um, and vice versa. If I start throwing this thing thinking it's on and they're just kind of not following it and not moving on it, it's too much action. Um, so as that water temperature creeps up, I would tell you to have a couple different swim bait options in the boat. Um, and then another little sneaky deal I probably shouldn't show is this little Ryugi keeper piece. Um, you will have days when they are eating the swim bait and maybe it's not as windy as it needs to be, or they're still on it, but they're not really committing is you will get tail biters in the spring that are pulling on this and you can actually feel them like come up behind it. And instead of sucking the whole bait and you can feel them just kind of like grab it and pull back and you'll pull it right out of their mouth. So that little keeper right there is super, super nice and subtle. Um, good, good hardware on it. I've never had an issue with it breaking or nothing like that. It's a little hook and you got to remember too, when you throw in these swim baits, most of the time these fish are looking up so they, mm. they can't even see that you have a hook up on top of this one. They're just watching that kind of action. And then this is just kind of like a diamond head, um, diamond head swim bait. So what size hook is that, that, uh, stinger? Um, I'd have to look. It looks like a one knot or is that like a, more like a two? Uh, I think I have twos. Okay. Yeah, I think the majority of them are twos, but it's you can find them on Tackle Warehouse, like under accessories, Ryugi makes it. Um, comes in a little two pack, probably way too expensive for what, it's, what it is, but um, definitely can be super, super helpful. So that's the gizzard shad deal that I would definitely be testing for that March, um, testing for that March BFL. The other side is the smaller bait. So one of the fish that I caught this weekend was a 470 was a super high suspended fish over like 70 feet, completely isolated alone, no bait around like, Hey, look, there's a giant blob over there. This is where people get frustrated about what front facing sonar does to fishing, but I don't care. Cause it's awesome it is set to hundred feet, 120 feet. And you're just looking around towards the bank and out. And I just saw this blimp on live scope out over 70 feet. She was like four feet under the surface, um, just warming up and was able to throw this little guy right here. So this is a Okashira screw head, little um, eighth ounce and a three inch spark shad. So a lot of the bait that's suspended in the pocket is little like ghost minnow size bait, little three inchers, maybe some thread fin out there, but it's a lot smaller than the gizzard shad. So matching the hatch is really, really important this time of year to get those bites on those weird transitioning suspended ones. And it only works like one out of 15 times. Like I would not necessarily me personally go out and try to catch 20 pounds doing that unless you really, really are seeing that that's a massive pattern, but that is a good way to pick off some three and a half pounders. Yeah. Brian Thrift talks about this, like the bonus fish, like in the summertime, yep. you always have a walking bait on just in case for those yep. bonus fish. Yeah, 100% that that's exactly what that was. I mean, basically we were coming down a pocket 25% back into the pocket, looking to the left on a contour line, seeing some fish down over there um, and then just looking to the right. And she just is in the middle of a ditch, just minding her own business and you feed them, you feed them what they're eating out there. So that's, you know, that's slick, calm conditions. You're not necessarily targeting that on a super gusty day, but on a little bit of a lighter wind, five mile an hour, that's probably a better day of doing that and targeting that. But that's the, um, that's the, really the only thing that I'm throwing out super deep right now. The Demiki bites still there. And I think there's still going to be smallies that can be caught doing that, but it's not going to be, 
I don't think it's going to be dominant this year. Got Chris Johnson with trying to get rid of some secrets mm. right now. How about the spy baiting? I mean, we sure. can't talk about that really. Um, I don't throw a ton. Um, I mean, the Okashira head with the screw lock is a spy bait, essentially. Mm. Um, I do believe in that bait a lot, a lot. And I do, I do throw, I actually like throwing spy baits in the summer. Um, so there's absolutely no reason that it wouldn't work because summer and winter set up very similarly as far as, as far as fishing goes. But I would tell you to keep an eye on how high the fish are. And, and for me, one thing that I'm really, really focusing on this time of year is I'm keeping the bait above the fish. They're ready to eat. They know they have to be aggressive. I don't like fishing horizontal to them. I want to see how they're reacting to something swimming above yeah. them and not giving them a great look at it. So, you know, if, if you're talking fish are less than 10 feet under the surface, I don't know if you throw a spy bait or a swim bait on them, but if they're 20 feet deep suspended, then yeah, maybe you throw a spy bait and, and, you know, slowly bring it over 20 feet on top of them. So no, that's a, that's a good alternative bait for sure. I guess it's whether you want to have treble hooks or not, honestly, yeah. it really comes down to. Uh, sure. So. Again, the, the, with the swim bait deal, you're talking, if a fish is looking up on it and hesitating, that's what they're seeing on the bottom. Yeah. I mean, it, that's true. Not, minus the screw lock and, and they make an Okashira head that doesn't have a screw lock is, uh, it doesn't, it just looks like a natural bait swimming. See, we got a couple more, a couple more. We got a ton of questions. Uh, we got Ju we got Judah here. What, uh, what depth range should I stick with for the swim baits or the glide? Honestly, I would assume just let your live scope or the fish tell you, but I'll let the professional answer it. No, that's, that's, that's the right, that's the right start. Um, for the tournament or, or let's just say starting today, I would say starting today, you're still dealing with fish on off of structure. You're dealing with fish that are just set up on secondaries, maybe not close to the structure, just kind of like they're, they're just transitioning. It's just straight transitioning fishing. You go down a bank. Sometimes they're at that bank. Sometimes they're not. They're on the side of the point. They're on top of the point. They're off the end of the point. You really have to look at each day and figure that out. Um, as we get closer into I don't, maybe that March tournament, um, but I would say after the March tournament is when you're going to be transitioning to fishing that stuff a lot shallower. So around docks, around laydowns, um, 10 feet or less, like those, those fish are going to be up there. So I would say you still have to be in that 10 to 20 foot range right now. And, and don't get me wrong. You can definitely throw the bigger swim baits out over those deeper fish. That's a daily reaction type thing. If it's a, seven pounder that's suspended out over nothing. She probably doesn't want to eat a three inch bait. She probably does want a six inch, um, a six inch bait. So I would say if you find multiples on your day of fishing, throw the small bait once, see how they react, throw the big bait once. But, um, yeah, I mean, I caught a 470 on seven pound line. If you put three of those in the boat and some three and a half pounders, you're sitting super good. Yeah. And I feel like with, with people and I'm gonna take a break here, just like for a little bit of gossip here. Cause it's like, I've done this enough and I've on social media enough. I feel like people get so zero or one black and white. Like what is the one bait I must throw all eight hours versus you? You're fishing one thing, but you have the Okashira head just in case this one, this one situation pops up, you're ready for it. I, I think when we're talking here, guys, that's, that's the open mindset you need is you have all these variables open. So if the conditions are right for it, boom, you can execute on that. Don't think it's all black and white. Yeah it's rare you're even going to have the same weather consistent for eight hours. I mean, yeah. even on the day, like, okay, the, the days where you do see like what we saw Saturday with, we'll just call it 10 bags close to 20. It blew 20 miles an hour from 6 AM till 7 PM. It was white capping the entire time. It never let up. Like it just was that day. Um, on a tournament, you're gonna ha you're, what you what you usually have through weather is you have a weather change before the sun comes up. Whatever is going on at night, whether that's calm or stormy, when the sun comes up and whatever happens in nature or however it works, the sun powers up, and the weather usually flips when the sun comes up, or vice versa. If it's like calm in the morning, mm -hmm. and the sun's coming in. As soon as the sun comes up, forty minutes after that, then it starts blowing. It's rare that it's like what happened in the middle of the night is the same thing that happens all day during the day. Um, so one, and then fishing is a hundred percent adjusting 
And number two is Smith Mountain is annoying in that aspect that it's not like a lot of Virginia lakes where it's a pattern deal like Bugs or Gaston or Anna, where it's you guys can't come out. If I caught 20 pounds on Thursday before the BFL, I would just from being out here, I don't know that I would feel confident that I can go catch 20 pounds on the exact same thing from Thursday. So it's an area like then. It's a s- area, spot, area. Yeah, area slash spot, but then massive adjusting. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's good and bad, dude. I mean, it makes you a really good angler because you have to run around, you have to adjust, clear to muddy to shallow to deep, and 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 kind of all of that in between. But um, yeah, I I would say typically for me on tournament stuff, there's at least ten rods on the deck for guiding. At a minimum, I've got six spinning rods on the deck pretty much all the time getting into the tournament tactics then and just avoiding every single question that's in the comment section um (laughs) would you say that that's the only way you can be successful to do that or could you camp at a creek and be kind of the japanese style of like yeah i'm just gonna fish this creek to death and make adjustments within the creek versus trying to run and gun the whole lake um yes and this would be the time of year to do it i struggle with that to be vulnerable for a moment (laughs) <laughs> I struggle with slowing down. Like I can slow down, but I mean like slowing down um, to where, you know, this is the time of year where if you do feel like there's a lot of life in a pocket, let's say there's 30 docks in a pocket. I'm the type of fisherman that puts it on nine, skips a Senko maybe one or two times under a dock max, flips a jig one or two times on a post and I probably leave a ton of fish and a ton of good ones to go try to find an aggressive fish where this is the time of year where if you feel like you had a winning pocket, maybe caught two or three big ones in practice, you should flip a Senko under a dock six times, or you should hit every dock post with a shaky head, um, or you should fish a jig fast over the rock vein under the dock and then come back from a different angle and fish it slow. And I think that's where me personally on on springtime fishing um i struggle a little bit as far as like and it's home lake advantage type crap too of like yeah yeah, 100 well well, maybe the smallmouth are firing off and let's run 20 minutes one direction when really we could have slowed down so i definitely think this is the time of year where the slower dragger guys can can put some serious damage on you um that's all preference and and the mental capacity to slow down but yeah, you can do that here in the spring. And I think it's the mental, it's, it's having the backlog on the lake. If mm-hmm. you are an individual or a seasoned pro that has been to a lake or lived on a lake so long, it, it innates this running gun mentality that you see the pros do. But then you look, and again, I keep going back to this, guys, and this is something I'm trying to use in my fishing more. You have these Japanese guys get plopped on a lake the first time, and they will say, like, this is my creek, and they end up in the top five. And people are like, well, how the hell do they do that? I think there's something to be said there. If you're coming down to Smith Mountain Lake for the first time, you will never have as many spots as a guy that's lived there. So don't fish that style yet. Yep. You know, that's something that you earn the right to do once you have a journal of spots, then you can kind of fish that style. That's yep. again, just my, my opinion on that. No, I, I agree with that hundred percent. And again, going back to your comment earlier, they're not going to turn around. Yeah, that's true. So maybe you pr- smash them on Wednesday up shallow Thursday gets weird Friday. You catch them out a little bit deeper. And then Saturday you start deeper and nothing's going on. Does that mean leave or did they, did they swim overnight back up shallow because it's a warming trend? Like that's the, that's Mm -hmm. the kind of slowdown stuff you got to do. Will, will my fishing partner says it perfect all the time, tries to beat it in my head. Like the fish can swim. (laughs) Um, and they're awake most of the night. So Are these your conversations oh, in the boat is him just telling yeah, you the fish can like swim. don't don't <laughs> think that just because they were locked on the rock pile in 18 feet a day and a half ago doesn't mean that they didn't swim to the it, it would literally take them three minutes to swim from a rock pile to the bank and then swim a hundred yards. Um so they're the, they're around. It's a matter of if you leave them or not. Mm, that makes yeah. sense. All right. Oh. Nope, I lost you, bud. I don't know. 
know what the hell that was. Sorry about that, but I think I'm back. You're back. Oh, thank God. Um, anyway, I think that is the chat getting mad at me because I have avoided all the questions. Yeah, good. Let's knock, let's knock these bad boys out. Yeah, that's a really good plan. Uh, first one up is one of my Patreon supporters, Timothy mm -hmm. Johnson. What test line for the big swim baits? I throw 16 or 18 pounds on a six inch uh, mag draft or the spark shad or really anything that's in that like five to six inch range swim bait. And then I throw a 20 pound sunline sniper um, for an eight inch mag draft. I feel comfortable with 20. Uh, a lot of it's rod based. If you, I throw a 795, it's got enough tip to where you can feel the bite and set the hook. And one thing on um, big swim baits that I don't know if we've really talked about it, maybe not so much on the six inch is once you get into an eight inch or a 10 inch class bait, it is a different way of setting the hook. Um, it's more of a load up and lean, not a Texas rig jam it to high heavens, like, you know, gung ho. It's definitely a more muscle memory type of, of, um, of hook set. So, the right rod is really, really important on big swim baits because if you're using too stiff of a rod, you're just going to pull the bait out of their mouth every time. And if you're using too little of a, of a rod, then you're not going to ever be able to load enough of that, um, enough of that bait. Cause there's a lot of plastic that is in their mouth. So I would, uh, I would throw a 20 pound line. I throw a Dobbins champion 795 is, is what I throw most of my bigger swim baits and glide baits on. There you have it. And then we got, let's see, we got a next one here from Austin. Uh, love the DMV episodes, especially with Billy. Uh, going to be getting in touch with him soon. Fishing Clater and Smith often would definitely take any advice. Thank you all for a good episode. Why are you fishing Clater? Don't do that. <laughs> that place is that place needs some TLC for sure. Yep. Um, let's see. Big big Mike Fishing Chronicles. What advice would you give mm. a co-angler? Very good question. We could do a five hour episode on co angler. So I did co angling for a long time. Actually, I fished the bass opens as a co angler for seasons um, and did did pretty well. Um, you have etiquette. So we'll go over kind of the etiquette side of co angling. I would tell you try to minimize or kind of just have a max, let's say a max of five rods. Um, don't overdo it on your tackle um don't overdo it on kind of like taking not taking up space but like try to try to be respectful to the size of the stuff that you are bringing as a co-angler honestly i wrecked them on a senko a shaky head and a drop shot for no matter the season and a swim bait little swim bait um so i would tell you a spinning rod in your hand is your best friend um, if you're good with a jig and skipping docks, you're probably going to end up dock fishing a little bit at Smith Mountain. So be ready for that. Um, and you can clean up from the back of the boat pretty good with a drop shot. Um, and and that's how I made a I, I made actually a pretty good amount of money fishing out of the back of uh, back of boats on the opens. So uh, it's easier to make money right off the back of the boat than the front. Is that I've I've heard that before that it's easier to cash checks um there's so much less mental like just pressure being a co-angler you have no idea where you're going the boaters casting on what they consider to be the juiciest spot so don't cast where the boater just casts um you you can i i, I would approach co-angling very simply cast where the boater didn't cast throw something the boater isn't throwing and if you can make it even more of a stretch from what he's doing. So if he's throwing a jig, throw a drop shot. If he's throwing a Senko, throw a swim bait. If he's throwing a shaky head craw, throw, uh, I don't know, throw just a Ned rig. Like change it up to where you're not anywhere close to what that person is doing. So if they're doing a horizontal presentation, do a vertical presentation. The, the best advice on out of the back of the boat would be, come prepared to change your fall rate. So that can be a huge, like that's a co-angler like goal mine is, let's say you're throwing an eighth ounce shaky head or a quarter ounce jig, or I don't know, a one sixteenth net head or something crazy. Nothing's really going on, but your boater's not catching anything. Force yourself to upsize your weights and start increasing your fall rate. Um, I know a lot of guys because you just don't even have the option when you're the co-angler. Let's say you get with a boater like me, 
and I got the trolling motor on nine and I'm hitting the juice as much as I can and moving on to the next thing, you have to increase your weight to even present a bait correctly. Um, that's a good point. And I'm talking like three eighth ounce drop shot weight sinker. Like if we're fishing docks that are deeper, like you got to get your stuff down there. But half the time you do that and you end up catching more fish because you're presenting a fall rate that nobody else is throwing. So thinking outside the box a little bit like that. Um, and then on the etiquette side, I mean, be gentle to the dude's boat. If don't step on the seats, if you got mud on your shoe, like take care of your shoe before you jump in, throw 40, 50, 60 bucks of gas um, and just be respectful. Maybe offer a unique drink, sports drink, an energy drink, um, a sandwich, bag of chips, a piece of candy, something like that. Um, and just try not to be a dick. Um, and then your boater shouldn't be a dick back to you. And if your boater's a dick, then be a dick because I don't understand how some of these horror stories that I hear where boaters are total asses. And I just don't understand that, uh, that attitude in uh, BFL or, or even an open level. I don't, I don't really understand the, the concept. This is fishing and it's a, it's a passion type deal. You shouldn't be. There's a lot of Randy Blockett's out there. We'll just leave it at that. Did uh, Randy oh. hey, did you see Randy Blockett's post? I heard that he would, did he actually get drawn as the co-angler or was he the boater? Well, I don't know in BFLs, is it a flip? Is it a four I, hour flip? I thought it was a four hour flip. I need to find out more about this story because I just wanted a camera in his boat so freaking badly Dude, for that. could you imagine, it's a randomizer, right? Yeah. Could you oh. imagine you're the like person at MLF and the randomizer kicks out Randy's a go? <laughs> Dude, I just walk out. I would you not just make that phone call. Oh you know, God, that's hilarious. The amount of shit he'd be talking to you. Uh, okay, we got we're almost down to the end here. We got Lee Wells. Don't you want to break it down like us kayak guys have to do since we don't have the range? Exactly. Like that's what I and, yeah. and the reason I was talking about the Japanese style is not just for the kayak situation, but it's just that is the other way you can do it. You yeah. either are hopping spots or you're picking an area and sitting down. And kayaking definitely teaches you that because you have no other option. Yep. Um, let's see. Okay. We got Jake Spate, uh, Matthew just won a gift card to Jake Spate and tackle for co-angling the March BFL. What size mm. bag are we looking for to place? Do you have any other recommendations for us who won't get any pre-fishing in? Yep. Um, we'll go over some other, some other baits here super quick. Mm -hmm. So I would say on the co-angling, you know, I don't know the BFL stuff off the top of your head. You can look up the tournament weights in the past, um, and kind of see, I would say there's probably going to be a lucky co-angler that catches 20 pounds out of the back. Um, but to place, I would say if you can add a minimum, but my goal with when I co-angled was as long as I get a limit, I feel like I'm going to get my entry fee back. And if I get a limit and I have a four pounder, I'm going to make some money. So that would be my goal would be what can I do to put a limit in the boat versus mm -hmm. what can I do to catch a giant? So Again, let's just jump real quick back to like, what's my pro throwing? If he's throwing a jig and he doesn't have a big swim bait on the deck, I would throw a big swim bait. But if he does have a big swim bait and he's lugging both around, then I would go to a spinning rod and start trying to play clean up. Um, or the other side, and I'll, I'll bring these up right now, is shaky head or a jig. So this is pretty much the first soft plastic I'm going to pick up for the year. This is a missile bait, six and a half inch quiver um and just kind of like this cherry red warlock head straight bubba fishing you're fishing it slow you're fishing every dock post you're fishing the lay down a couple times you're you're really picking something apart as in what the kayak guy said you're throwing this thing around and you're taking your time with it but we're about to turn the corner where the shaky head's going to be a massive player so if if you're a co-angler and your boater's doing the stuff that i mentioned earlier I would pick up something like this as cleanup because your boater's probably not going to pick something like this up until the last couple hours of the day. And then the second thing with that, and this goes back to my weight conversation, there's two jigs that I throw in the spring. They're both Ike mini flips, but it's a color specific thing and it's an action on the trailer. So mm -hmm. this is an Ike mini flip green pumpkin. I've got it sitting here with the uh, um, twin turbo grub. A lot of movement to it. This is probably going to be closer to the BFL as far as what I want to do, but this is going to be the jig that I'm going to swim around. Um, so hitting the bottom, lifting it up, swimming it around a little bit, dropping it back down, kind of giving it a little bit of that kind of crawdad running around type of motion. 
Um, and then the other one is a little quarter ounce. So you guys see the size of that head right there. Um, different trailer for missile baits on there, a lot of less motion, but the color on here is Ike's Secret. A lot of the crawdads that are coming out of the, the rocks in early spring are gonna have a hue of like a sandy brown um, blue. So like that brown right there, how it's not green pumpkin, it's kind of like sand finish. And then a little bit of that blue is what uh, what the crawdads might have. I would maybe trim this blue down a little bit to where we don't have so many strands. Interesting. Uh, but something a really little compact, quarter ounce, you could throw this on a seven foot three power rod and skip this thing all around docks like crazy. Um, so even this, this would be a situation I would say where if your boater's throwing a half ounce jig or a bigger profile jig, you could follow behind with something like a quarter ounce, trim the skirt down, make it a little bit more like a, kind of like a cookie morsel um, and just something a little bit smaller for, for that. But that would be my advice to co-angling is if he's throwing big baits, throw small baits, or if he's not throwing a swim bait, then go ahead and pick up a swim bait. Jess, what's your favorite swim jig color? And then we also went with him again saying, uh, blue in the jig is the worst. Uh, shut up, Billy. I guess it's assuming what he's trying to say there. Hey, that's uh, Mr. A that's Mr. Uh, Ash Ketchum, isn't it? That's Mr. Ash Ketchum, I believe. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, you catch him. We got Judah here. This kind of gets us actually all cut up. Thank God. Um, the past mm. few times I have been up on Smith Mountain Lake, I have found those metal structure structure piles that are dropped in by I guess Lake Management. Are those things are those things stuff I should go back to this spring? Yeah. So those are I believe they call them mossy backs, um, and they are dropping a ton in Smith Mountain. Um, I think I read an article, it was either last fall or the fall before that they dropped 86 in one fall. Um, it's this weird structure. It's like a kind of like a main pipe structure and then angle pieces, like 20 of them off, off of the side of them. They're not all in five feet, Judah. A lot of them are, um, they're meant for forage. So they're meant for bluegills and crawdads and little minnows to hide in. They're going to hold fish. I have never really caught a giant out of them, but they hold tournament quality like limit keepers. Um, some of the deeper ones are good in the summertime for some like mm -hmm. whole top water fish out of the ones that are in like 12 to 14. Um, but I, they're worth checking, but I wouldn't say that's going to be like a tournament pattern. Um, especially with most of, most of them are on main Lake. Um, and at that point, if you're talking March 9th, I don't know that they're going to be super loaded. I would, I would focus more on those in the summertime. Guys, that is, you guys absolutely killed it with the questions right here. Uh, I am pretty sure I got everyone's questions answered. If you guys, for the ones that won a prize, message me on Facebook, Instagram, or, uh, email me fishing DMV at gmail.com. And I'll get you one. We got one more here. Um, let's see, we got, we got Kevin, uh, thanks for the recommendations. Please. Just rig it. Uh, they did a great job putting my Garmin setup on, uh, let's see. I think that's all of them. Perfect. So I guess the we last thing, that, yeah, we can use that segue as a, uh, as a sponsorship if you'd like, cause that's yep. one of my, one of my, um, kind of secondary sponsors, I guess I would say. Kick it. So, uh, Thomas and I talked guys before this, as far as it's the beginning of the year. <sighs> Obviously, I'm a, a fishing guide at the lake, and um, the business has has taken off, and we've been blessed to to be able to do it as much as I have been doing it and support my family. And and one of the questions that I get a lot from December to now, and as tournament season starts, is sponsorship. So Thomas and I wanted to kind of pick apart or kind of explain the the sponsorship side of things. So to to hit on just rig it, they're a, a electronics rigging company down near Martinsville. Um, that does custom rigging, custom bracket making, CNC uh, type of work. And, and that's who's basically wired my boat. And then he just helps me with miscellaneous crap on my boat um, all the time. But um, that was just a connection through, through tournament fishing and, you know, through guiding, I'm obviously have the right platform to be able to send people to uh, a sponsor like that and grow that relationship. Um, so I guess the, the main question I get, and you can tell me if, if not, is how do I get sponsors? 
Um, and as, as generic as that question is, I can answer it very black and white. And I believe you and me talked a little bit before, and this is the deal is you have to provide a benefit that's greater than what you would get in return. And I know that's not the most exciting thing, um, to hear and talk about, but it is all about networking and relationship building. But unfortunately, as the person that is trying to get the sponsor, if it is a new relationship, you have to take the L. You have to do work that probably should be getting paid. Um, you need to be putting your best foot forward on presenting yourself, your attitude, your consistency is massive. You know, mad respect for you, um, Thomas and your wife. You guys are super consistent. That's why the podcast is taking off is because you're putting in the work and consistently having unique guests and talking about topics and doing this thing and consistency, no matter if it's sponsorships or really, really anything in life. Um, consistency is what makes mm -hmm. that happen. And on the sponsorship side, that's what's going to get your foot in the door is consistently showing up and maybe giving, um, you know, giving a little bit more than you would say right out the gate um, is, is the way that I have approached sponsorships for a long time. Um, and with that comes networking and, you know, people see you as an opportunity to grow their brand. Um, and with that, the other side of fishing that's interesting is it, it's, it's one big bucket we'll say. Yeah. Um, and that makes it a little bit frustrating and a little bit hard too, because you've got hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of hands in the same bucket and differentiating your aiding yourself is, is, uh, a lot of work takes a lot of work, um, that you again, feel like you should maybe get paid for. But the other side to that is I think a lot of people miss the mark on non-endemic sponsors. And so that's something you and I kind of talked about when we were doing the live, uh, when you were at the show is, you know, Paul's, Paul's rigging bass boats, but he's also has the ability to rig any type of boat. So it's not necessarily that it's a hundred percent fishing related, um, for that type of sponsorship. The other ones that I've picked up over the last year is a landscaping company. It's a repeat guide client. I am on the lake all the time dealing with people that live here people that have lake rentals, people that need mowing services, everything like that. So it made sense after having that conversation with, with him to have a partnership going that I can generate leads to him. And in that case, it's the form of, of financing back to me. And the other one is a roofing company that just started at Smith Mountain. They're growing their business and they see the impact that, uh, that guiding has on the community and, and the people that, um, the people that come. So the sponsorship deal, I would say, try to hone your skills on influence um, versus tournament results. And I'm sure that's going to annoy some people, but the culture has changed honestly 180 in the last three years, but a definite 180 in the last 10 years where tournament results are great. But there's what, what are we dealing with now? Five national tournament trails Two of them you actually have to qualify for. The other ones you're just paying an entry fee. I don't know that that has the clout anymore to the masses um, in the form of you're a good salesman, you're a good business person, you're a good person um, to kind of help those sponsors. So for me, that's that's just how I've I've approached sponsorships is is being a servant's heart and. Uh, probably doing more than I should, but it, it comes back, dude. It comes back full, uh, full circle for sure. Grow your community. You got to be able to grow your community and your brand. And while you're doing that, keep saying this is something that was hidden when I took my MBA program is what value are you providing? Not what you're getting. Um, I've turned down a couple of sponsorship opportunities and it wasn't money based. It was, I didn't think I could provide the value they were looking for. And you'd be like, well, that's crazy. But it's like, that comes back on you eventually if you don't provide value. And it might not be now, it might be in five or six years, but your name and what you bring, for the people that do sponsor this show, I know based on the analytics, I am giving them 10,000% their value. And that sticks with you. And then down the road, when you maybe sign that major deal, and guess what? These people all talk, by the way, spoilers. They'll be like, oh yeah, no, he's 100%. He's straight up. He'll do what he says. That's freaking important. Your word 
nowadays, authenticity is the currency of the future. Mm -hmm. And if you're your authentic self and you bring value, eventually the money will come 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a patient game. I consider myself to be a extremely patient person um, with with what comes with life. And and back to your point of say turning a sponsorship away, maybe it's just a timing thing. Maybe it's two years from now. It makes perfect sense, and it's the it's the mm -hmm. right you know it's the right fit. We we talked before um, before the show. Like I'm I'm in the very infant stages of potentially talking to some dealers on a, on a boat deal just because could I have gone and asked for a boat deal starting year one with my guide business? Sure. But it would have been a lot harder and maybe not a great ROI for, for these local dealers where now I can go in and say, look, I'm doing close to 200 trips a year. Here's the influence on the internet. Here's the website analytics. Here's all, here's all these numbers that make perfect sense as well. I'm happy to do, you know, uh, live streams, podcasts, seminars, all that sort of stuff. And it just, it, uh, I don't know, it, it always kind of feels in life like you're not making any headway. And then all of a sudden <clears throat> everything kind of comes to, comes to the yeah. front and you realize the whole time, like you were definitely yeah. chipping away at it. So it's, uh, it's that consistency game that you just kind of keep chipping away at it and, and go that route. Um, you know, I just signed on with mega bass, which is, so stoked, um, which is so cool um, to be able to say that I'm part of the team and part of the com community of that. Um, and then what you and I kind of talked about on the other side, as far as is me and growing the community, you know, if there's anybody that listens to this podcast or, or rewatches it or anything like that, that's not necessarily not necessarily related to fishing, um, but just lake life or Smith Mountain Lake community or um, you know, any sort of non endemic type of sponsor, I am happy to have conversations with people these days on the value that I can bring on the amount of people that I that I talk to daily, both on the water and just through networking on the internet. And, and one way I think you can get back and this is I mean, you have a guide service. So you actually have the ability to communicate and build that kind of relationship with a group. I see so many anglers that ask about how they can build a community, but they won't volunteer for like high school fishing and stuff like that. And like, dude, that is a number one way. If you want to gain kind of some clout in a community where you are, go take some high schoolers fishing, go become a high school fishing coach and you will eventually get sponsors, but you're going to start building that tribe of people that are around you that think you're a good person. And that will honestly, that is so more valuable than money. And I, mm -hmm. I know it's kind of, you got to see the forest through the trees there when I say that, but the value of who you are and your brand is so much more in person than the dollar amount because the dollar amount will chase that the dollar amount will chase your brand sure. recognition and the value of you as a person yeah so, if, if, if you think of the business side so for example i went to the the salem high school two weeks ago or something like that it's their first or second season as a high school fishing team they've only got one guy i think committed to taking kids out and there's 19 kids in the class mm -hmm. um i can't do it because i'm a guide but you know, if, if I'll say this on here, if there's anybody in the Roanoke Valley, Salem, Clater, any of those guys that wants to get involved in that type of stuff, that's what companies care about. Because if you're taking a 17 year old kid out fishing and you've, uh, it, it, they catch a six pounder on a mag draft, guess what they're doing with their allowance money or their lawn mm -hmm. mowing money or their target <clears throat> money that they work at? They're buying mag drafts, they're buying fishing rods, they're buying the brands that you help them catch mm -hmm. fish. And that's not even from a guide perspective. That's just from a, a dude taking some people fishing or a lady taking some people fishing. Companies look at sponsorship in that form. They don't look at, oh, um, Billy's able to go out on Smith Mountain and catch a five pounder once a week because it's time on the water and I have the experience to be able to do that. It's how am I impacting the community or or selling product for them. And, and that's a, a perfect example is volunteering and creating that. And it gives you the clout and the name recognition. And uh, dude, it just feels good for your soul to just do that type of stuff anyway. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my sponsorship spiel. And I feel like God's blessed us and we're having a killer start to the year of just networking and having great conversations with companies and stuff like that. So it's been, it's been pretty fun. And hold out. Um, I think I've had some people come out with like two YouTube subscribers and asking for money and stuff like that. And the longer you hold out, the more your value will be worth. And if you guys don't understand how corporate America works, I would rather sign you at 500 YouTube subscribers than 10,000 or 100,000 because 
once your contract is set and locked, you're only going to make a certain percentage over that contract. So keep that in mind. If I sign you for a hundred dollars and I'm Geico, okay, you might get a best case scenario, a 20% raise. If you hit your analytics, that looks great for me as Geico, because I would rather sign you. And then you go parabolic to a million because I can be very generous at 20% and I make out like a bandit. So really keep that in mind. The longer you hold out, the better it will be for your brand. hundred percent. Um, I don't really got anything else. Let's see here. Take rig boats. Yep. I think that's everything. So what do you have coming up? Where can people find you? Do you have any more guiding trips available? Um, so I made that post the other day. Spring is, uh, we're definitely in big fish season. So if you are looking to try to catch the biggest fish of the year and want to go throw big baits, try to get with me as soon as possible. Most of my weekends are pretty booked up, um, till about April. So if you can sneak away on a Friday or, or get down during a week, uh, let me know sooner rather than later. Uh, website, smithmountainlakefishing.com, Billy Cole's fishing on, on all my social media stuff. Um, we've got a fundraiser tournament, if I can chat about that super quick. Um, February 25th, uh, we unfortunately lost one of our local anglers at a, at a really young age this past weekend um, named Rick Tilly. And he... Uh, um, unfortunately bad diagnosis with cancer and, uh, it took him really, really fast. So the, the community is pretty heartbroken down here at the lake, but we did get a tournament together for the 25th. Um, obviously the proceeds are going to go back to the, to the Tillies and there's a bunch of door prizes that they're doing as far as, um, kind of like raffle ticket stuff. Um, you guys can check on Facebook or message me directly on any of the social media stuff. Uh, if you have questions on how to do the raffle stuff, I gave a guide trip away. Um, one of the other guides gave a trip. We have a mega bass bundle. Uh, they're giving away a rifle, bunch of striper trips. Like there's, there's just a lot of cool stuff that you guys can win. And then obviously that's going back to the Tillies, the tournaments eight to two. And then we're all heading to, uh, to a firehouse to just do a cookout and just, uh, kind of just be in the community together. So if anybody has questions on that, um, you can message me or take a look on my Instagram. I posted about it maybe a month ago. So that's coming up on the 25th. And then the 24th, the day before on Saturday, there's a fishing expo at the East Lake Church down here. Um, they're talking possibly 300 plus people coming in and I'll be talking for three hours. So if Damn. an hour and 30 minutes on here wasn't enough, um, you can head down. I'm going to talk about just generic springtime bass fishing, kind of a little bit about what we talk now. Um, and then I'm going to talk about topography map breakdown and how to follow fish, which if you're a technical guy or you have electronics questions, that's a good thing to come for. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is the super sneaky secret stuff, which is how to target trophy bass with big baits. So we'll be talking about a lot of big, big rods, big line, big baits, and uh, going for that one one bite a day type of approach to fishing. And that's on the 24th. And then after that, man, it's just guiding and guiding and tournaments, my friend. That's freaking awesome. Uh, guys, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. Uh, as always, uh, this will become privatized so I can polish it up because I got a late night and then it's going to be re-uploaded tomorrow morning on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, the whole shebang. On Wednesday, we have uh, the interview with Matt Downs of Tricked Out Tens. Uh, he created like a $100,000 aluminum rig that's absolutely pimped out and sick. So we're going to talk about his life story. Uh, like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Later. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.